Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining and welcome to our webinar on Office 365 collaboration. I'm going to start off by going through our top applications for working from home, which will include a brief overview of Planner and OneNote and also a more in-depth overview of Microsoft Teams just because it's uh, amazing for collaboration. This will be followed by Alex Waterton with his Tips and Tricks Office 365 session which will be more of a training session focused around Word, Excel, PowerPoint and Outlook. If there are any questions during my section, these will be answered in an email response following today's event. With Alex's, as it is more training focused, he may be able to answer questions live. To start off, I'd like to give you a little bit of information on who we are and what we do. So we are ADM Computing. We're an IT services and support company based in Kent, covering London, South East and further. We were established in 1984. That makes us around 34 years old now. We have 70 staff, three quarters of whom are technical and service delivery teams. We are also a Microsoft Gold Partner and our competencies involve not only exams, but actually deploying the technology. So we're really living and breathing this stuff. We are a highly rated partner with many other industry leading vendors and we are security wise ISO 9001, 14001, 27001 and Cyber Essentials Plus accredited. So I'm going to run you through an overview before we start the session today just to give you a brief idea of what we'll be covering. So I really want to drill down into the collaboration and working from home side of Office 365 given the current situation. So we'll be running through Microsoft Teams. What is Microsoft Teams? Chat and Teams. The admin center demo, so this will be more into the administration side and it won't be super technical just because of the variety of viewers we've got today. We'll also be going through Skype for business and important announcement on that. We'll be going through some features coming soon with Microsoft Teams in the next few months. A very brief overview of Microsoft Planner and OneNote just to explain a few other further collaboration options you've got with Office 365. And then I'll pass over to Alex Waterton from F Keys for his tips and tricks session. So with that said, what is Microsoft Teams? Microsoft Teams is a chat centered collaboration powerhouse. It allows for calling, conferencing and meetings. You can work with your team, whether they're internal to your organization or external. With Teams, you'll have the access to the integration of content, applications, including Office 365 and third party, and persistent chat. So that means all of your conversations in one chat, in one place, so nothing gets missed here. In short, Microsoft Teams is your single pane of glass. Let's now talk about the chat and team chat features. So this is Teams. This is usually the landing page when you open the application. And as you can see, it's a clean, simple interface. You do have your tabs on the far left, and I'm currently in the chat section. In this screenshot, I'm in a group chat with three other colleagues. And again, this really shows the collaboration opportunity you're getting with this. You may have also noticed a message in bold. This simply means it's unread. Now, if we do move into the Teams section on the far left, we can see the teams I've been added into. Currently in my demo team and in the general section. In the chat section is where I view. The team chat, which I've set up with RSS feed of BBC News at the moment. You can also share files in the file section. And you can also integrate Office 365 and third party apps into the team by selecting the plus button. At the moment, we're using a team to communicate with the engineers responsible for us working from home. So this is really useful if we need any help or support or they need to make any announcements to the organization as a whole. And also one more thing to note is the external uh, on the end of this um, channel. So we have Microsoft 2020 events planning and then we have brackets external. This shows to other colleagues of mine that this chat will include external members of the team. So these are people in different organizations who we've invited into this channel of the team. Just means that we can be secure by not sharing any files that may be confidential to our organization internally. So how do you access all of this? Well, you can access your single pane of glass anywhere. You have full support across platforms and devices. 
Teams is currently available on Windows, Android and iOS, so you don't have a lack of options here. Most importantly with Teams and the whole Office 365 suite is that you can ensure you are secure when you're using it. And on this note, I would like to give you a brief overview of the admin side of Teams. Now, as I said at the start, I won't dive too much into the technical side of things as we do have a variety of viewers watching, but the admins will know how this can support them with their daily duties. So let me jump into an example administration center here. So this is for a demo company called Contoso Electronics. This is just a space where you can train and learn how to use the admin center, which Microsoft has set up. So you have a few little bits on the dashboard here. You have user search, you have user activity, you have your organization's information and some training sections down here. As I said, this is just the dashboard. There's so many more features down here. So if we jump into Teams, we can manage our Teams and Teams policies. We can jump into and drill down into any team that's being created within the organization. For example, the sales and marketing team. You can see all of the members here and go into them individually. You can view the channels within that team and go down to them. You can also go into the settings and moderate how you want. We also have devices. This is IP phones, things like that, that link to Teams. We have locations, emergency addresses, network topology. The users section, this is where you can view each individual user. So if I go down into this, and click into Alex Wilbur, for example. You can see he's a marketing assistant based in the United Kingdom. Here's his contact details. You have a seven day activity on Teams. Obviously, this isn't showing much because it is a demo. You can also go down into his individual account settings. So his audio conferencing settings, you can reset the pin, conference ID. You can go into his call history to view how many calls he's made and to who. And you can set him individual policies as well. So this is really useful, this users section for individual users. You can view your meeting settings, conference bridges, meeting policies, live events policies, and the live event is what we're running off today for this webinar. Here you have messaging policies. This is one that you may spend uh, a lot of time in. So if we go down into our global policy, we can actually moderate, for example, the fun bits of Teams. So do you want to enable GIFs? If so, how strict do you want those? And a lot of organizations will not want GIFs, memes or stickers in their organization, and that's fine. You can just disable them. So it's a really simple interface, just on and off toggles. You have Teams apps, so you can manage your apps and permission policies. So for example, if I don't want this app called Ava, I can simply tick it and block it. And if I then decide actually this app would be useful to the organization, I can just allow it. And this means that individual users and teams can install these applications within their team. You have your voice settings, so you have your dial plans, routing, uh, phone numbers and policies and things like that in there. And there's so many more features in this admin center that you can access. Your org wide settings. You also have the Skype for Business legacy portal. And on that note of Skype for Business, I would like to just make a quick announcement on that. So Skype for Business online end date was announced at the end of July 2019, and it will be ending July 2021. Skype for Business on premises will be continuing with Server 29 Suite was announced this year. It is time to begin planning now for this so that you have a smooth transition. Now, finally, let's talk about some exciting new features coming soon to Microsoft Teams. So we have custom background being combined with the current background blur feature. This is already rolled out to some locations and means you can put an image behind you, just like you're in front of a green screen. This can be really useful if you're in a busy background environment. If you're at home and you want to look like you're in your office, you can do that. You also have hand raising that allows people to raise their hands in meetings to notify others in the meeting that they'd like to speak. So that means there's no more interruptions here. It means if you're in a big conference call or in a sales meeting or a marketing meeting, you can simply have users raise their hands to notify others that they would like to speak. 
There will be even more messaging extensions coming to Teams soon, such as forms and polls available directly in the chat and Teams chats. And finally, multi-window chat for ease of access to different people, teams and channels. So now we've discussed Teams, let's take a look at another collaboration tool that Microsoft offers. It's called Planner. And I'm going to jump into that for you now. So this is my planner home. And this is called the Planner Hub. Here I have my business development team and marketing to do's. And if I scroll down, I've created one for this presentation called to do. If I click into that. And I group by progress, for example. I can see that completed tasks. I've already done the Office 365 intro webinar. I've created this presentation today. I'm currently in the midst of doing this presentation here, and as you can see, that's in progress. And I haven't started answering the questions yet. And those questions will be answered in an email following this presentation. I can also change the priority of these so I can mark these as urgent, for example. We can go right down into the start date, due date, notes. We can add checklist items. And tick them off individually. We can add attachments like files, spreadsheets, uh, pictures, anything you'd like, and also display them on that task in the dashboard. You can add comments here. And if you have other members of the team inside this planner, then they can add comments and you can communicate like that. You can even color code your tasks and you can rename these colors as well. You don't just have a list of tasks here. It's not just a simple to do list. You also have charts. So this shows how many tasks you've done, how many you've got to go, how many tasks in your bucket and the bucket just means the total of tasks in that planner. You can see your tasks on the right panel here. And you can see the priorities. So that one that's urgent here, you can see that's in the urgent section and I've got one in medium that needs to be done as well. You have members of the team, so at the moment it's just me, but if I were to add other members into this, you'll be able to see a whole list of members there. You can even look at these tasks as a calendar view and see what you need to do on which day. So you can see how useful that could be for, for many organisations and many teams in the working from home environment. And now we've taken a look at how you can manage tasks more effectively and efficiently. Let's take a look at streamlining your notes in OneNote. So again, I'm going to jump into uh, the app here. This is OneNote. And you can see that I've opened my demo notebook. You can have multiple notebooks in this section here. I have my personal one, which I use for my notes, my to do's, bits and pieces like that. I also have our marketing team, which is a collaboration notebook. So this means that there's many people in that. And I also have this demo notebook that I'm in now. So for example, if I name this page in the notebook, demo one, and let's say I have some notes on this and I want to add another page. And I want this page to be called demo two, but I actually want to make this a sub page of demo one. You can promote or demote ranks like this, so you can add this into this. So now we've got a sub page for demo one. You can even collapse these and make a drop down. Now when you're actually taking notes, you can click and add text anywhere. You can add in drawings, for example. And then you can take those drawings and move them. And type around them as well. So it's a really useful tool. Not just drawings and text, you can also insert spreadsheets directly into the OneNote, pictures, images, online videos, recordings, audio and video. Everything's in this one notebook. You also have sections up the top. So I could call this marketing. And I could call this collaboration where I work with my team. So OneNote's got a lot of features and I definitely don't have enough time to go through all of them today. What we are going to do this morning is in a moment I will pass over to Alex to go through 
all the tips and tricks that are prominent at the moment when you're working from home and enabled you to work more efficiently and effectively within that work environment. So that's a brief overview of OneNote there. And this morning we've had a overview of our top three Office 365 collaboration apps. I will now pass over to Alex from FKeys to discuss some top tips and tricks that you may not have known about. But uh, before I do, I'd just like to say thank you everyone who tuned in today, wherever you're working from at the moment. And if you do need anything, feel free to reach out to us on the number on the screen or do shoot me over an email where I'll get back to you as soon as I'm able to. And thank you once again, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you for tuning in and goodbye. I'll now pass over to Alex with his tips and tricks session. Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the tips and tricks session from ADM. Um, I'm just going to call up a couple of bits and pieces to go through um, here. Um, starting with um, this one here. Great. Keyboard's collapsing. <laughs> Uh, my name's Alex Walston. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer and I partner with ADM, um, but my company is actually F Keys Limited. Um, so generally when we're working from home, um, because of the current situation, what we've got is uh, a big drop from a great height for a lot of companies. Um, generally within the office, obviously the concentration is around um, Excel, Word, PowerPoint and Outlook. However, um, now we've actually all been forced to almost all go home and start working. The power of the likes of OneNote, Teams, Planner, To Do, Task and Forms has come into its own. Um, and one of those things that spring to mind for me is um, that when we actually do this, if you consider where you were with Microsoft Excel, Word and PowerPoint. Um, when did you start using these Office applications? And you might have started as far back as Office 2003, where shortly after that we got introduced to Office 2007 and the new ribbon approach to using Microsoft Office. This was a little bit of a culture shock. Um, because people didn't realise or the new interface and didn't like it, they couldn't find anything from there. Um, but what's actually happened is obviously the change was to enable the likes of the other devices, tablets, phones and everything else to be able to work together in a more integrated fashion um, of, of using Office. And the Office documents changed from DOC for Word to DOCX. X being extensible markup language, which allows the portability of documents across the devices and applications. But what I'd like you to think about is that wherever you started your Microsoft Office journey, um, if you go back and find the one that you know you think you started with, since 2003, October 2003, we've had Office 2007, Office 2010, Office 365, where it came predominant with um, some online applications as well, um, added into the mix. And then we got to Office 2013, 2016, and now we're on 2019. And obviously Office, Microsoft Office is developing that even more, and obviously more uh, versions will come out in their date. But what I'd like you to ask you is, in today, how differently are you using your Office applications today than you did when you first started to use Microsoft Office? The truth of the matter is you probably are not using it that differently. So what can we do? Well, here with Microsoft Office, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce you to some features and functions that you might know about, you might not know about, but you will find that un unless you include part of the training, um, then you end up doing what you always do every time you come into work. So here we're going to be looking at Microsoft Word. Now, as I'm going through these, um, I haven't got my chat window open for the webinar, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to type any questions as we work through. 
into the chat window. Christian will pick that up and after each um, application, um, if he finds any questions there, he can throw at me. I'll try and cover them after each section so that um, we can deal with those there and then. If you do have any questions or we miss any, then please feel free to email Christian um, and he'll forward them to me from there on. So let me look at the uh, open Microsoft Word element. Now, over here, what we have got are various recent documents that's been opened. But one of the things that people are unaware of sometimes is that if you hover on these lists, what you've got is you've got a pin. Um, and if you want to pin any of these applications, you can do so. So here you can see that my Apple application number two is actually pinned because under here we have it pinned at the top. Now, the one underneath is not pinned, but I can pin it simply by going to the pin and adding the pin to it. They're both now pinned and can be seen under the pin section. But if I wanted to unpin them because they're no longer required to be pinned, I can simply unpin it. And now we have a pinned and an unpinned document. What's the use of this or the benefits? Quite simply, there's a number of reasons. One, they might be a document that you're working on over a period of time. So rather than keep opening it or digging down through the folders and everything else to find it, you can pin that document or possibly a project document um, on your list. And therefore, as you open other Word documents or Excel documents on the go, um, they will go into the recent list and drop off the bottom, but any of your pinned documents will remain within your screen and will be easily accessible um, right from the open window. And of course, the other one there is the fact that if you have a document that you have to keep digging down through folder, folder, folder uh, to find it and you open that on a regular basis, then that's another good reason to pin a document there, which will save you a lot of um, digging down through the folders to actually find. Now, this feature itself is available in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, so I won't be going through that again, obviously, when I get to those, but look for those pins and um, start using Using them because they can be most beneficial. So I'm going to go into um, a blank document. And here I have uh, my blank document. Up the top here, I have the general ribbons. And of course, all the ribbons are split down into um, the labels at the top of the list for each category. Um, and each ribbon again is split into clipboard, font or groups as it's known along the bottom. So we have a ribbon and we have groups. And sometimes it's very difficult, especially if you're swapping between a laptop or a desktop and you can't actually see the icon that's actually there. One of the things you should remember is these little kicker arrows on the bottom of each group because if you can't find something and it's relevant to a paragraph or a font, you can easily click on one of these kicker arrows and it will open a dialogue box and give you all the other available options that you might be struggling to find. So use those kicker arrows to open and adjust anything else that you might want to uh, find things like uh, superscript, subscript, small caps, all caps and things of the font, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So don't um, shy away from hitting those uh, kicker arrows. Now up the top here, you will actually see we have what's called the quick access toolbar, a very useful tool um, rather than hunting through all the menus. There are two buttons, however, I highly recommend that people add to all of their office applications. So I'm going to give you those two. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click the arrow to the right hand side with the left mouse button. And the, here we will get a short list of all the other buttons and tools we could add to the quick access toolbar. This is what I call the popular popular list. And you can simply um, tick to add uh, a button on there or you can actually tick to remove it from the button. But the two that I want to add to them are actually found in the more commands dot 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 uh, element. So by clicking on more commands, you get this other area. Now on the right here, 
we have all of the ribbon bars, the quick access ribbon tools. And over here, we have a large list, which is generally what I call the popular commands showing up here as popular commands. Now, this isn't an extensive list. The extensive list that I actually want is found by clicking the down arrow to the right of popular commands and then coming across and clicking all commands. When you click all commands, this list will get dramatically longer. And as you can see, it is very extensive. It is in alphabetical order, so you can actually just click anywhere on one of those and then click a letter on the keyboard and it will jump down to that particular group as in the letter C here. Now, the first one that I generally add is if I scroll down through this, you will eventually come to the one which is called close file and this is one of the ones I like to add onto my quick access toolbar. And in order to add it, um, what you can do is you simply either can double click on that and it will jump across here, or you can click the add button in the middle to add it across. Once you've added it across, you're then able to move it vertically up and down the um, quick access toolbar. The second one that I add is pressing S jumps down to the S's and here it's this one here, which is save as other format um, and it's got a little kicker arrow on the right hand side to extend the menus. Um, so click, click on that one, choose add and it will come across to the quick access toolbar here. Now here you can see um, these two that I've actually added. And right at the top of the element, there is a thing called a, uh, a separator. And if you add those um, in, what they do is they add these vertical lines. If you look up the top left of my screen, you can see where the vertical lines are appearing. So I'm just going to remove that one. And here, this is where you can actually create a separator for any group. So if you were putting quick access toolbars, in there and you had a section for formatting or a section for styles, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can create those vertical bars using the separator uh, to help you define where they will be, et cetera, et cetera. So two to add, close file and save as other format. Uh, two of the most popular ones that I add to the quick access toolbar. I will demonstrate those very shortly. Once you've actually done and customized any buttons for your quick access toolbar, then you can actually just click OK and those will actually appear here now. Now, one of the tools that um, is quite valuable is um, autocorrect. Um, and not a lot of people make use or the full use of autocorrect or auto text as another option is. Uh, a simple element of auto or a sample of autocorrect is that if I type full stop AW and press space, you can see that my name automatically appears, saving me the time of, of retyping it. If I want to sign off a letter, for instance, I might put full stop A, W and S and that when I press return will give me yours sincerely and full stop A, W, F will actually give me yours faithfully. So this is auto correct and most of you probably are aware that if you type T, E, H, um, Word automatically adjusts that and changes it to the and that is already built into the system. But in order to add something, you might want to um, type in. So if I put in uh, Alex Smith and then highlighted this, I can now go to the file menu and go to options and go to proofing. And for here is where I find autocorrect options. And as I've highlighted the Alex Smith, what I can do is when I click on autocorrect, you'll notice that whatever I've typed is already in this section. And here I need to just type um, whatever it is I want to type. So it changes to Alex Smith. Now I could easily put AS and say every time that I type AS, 
it will change automatically to Alex Smith. Now, you might not think that that's a good idea and you would be quite right because you would possibly type AS um, as um, part of that. So you have to think a little bit further about the field and that's where I use full stops. So in actual fact, what I actually change is anything with autocorrect, I put a full stop before the actual characters. So here, full stop AS and now that will put Alex Smith so if I now choose add and say OK and OK and now when I type full stop AS it gives me Alex Smith but I can comfortably type as and it will only put as. Now this can be quite extensive because you can build up your own list of quick elements that are there for that long company that you don't like typing and you keep getting the spelling wrong or can't remember and you can add even more it's not just simple text you can actually go full stop d oh, would help if i spelt it right details and that could actually put in your full address all the company details telephone numbers and things uh, right the way through so please feel free to use autocorrect for anything like that now there is another section whereby if I do over here on the right um, when we actually go through you can actually insert and there is an element for quick parts um, which is elements and things. Um, so on the up with that what we can do is add um, what's called as auto text and auto text is large bits. So I'm not going to go into great depth of this one because you know, I don't want to cover everything all around one thing. But here's an example. If I type equals format, it will tell me that there is an auto text feature there. And if I continue to type, it would ignore that. But the fact that this little box has popped up is telling me, do you want to insert the auto text bit? And as I do, if I just press enter now, what I actually get is a number of pages. And as you can see, there's a large number of pages. So whereby some people sometimes use templates and things, auto text can actually be one of the beneficial things for um, elements like this. OK, so here I have my document um, and I've put in some auto text and now we're back into Word. One of the things that uh, really sometimes winds me up is uh, the amount of people, as I said, that are using Word and Excel and everything else uh, on an ongoing basis, but they still manage to go to a heading and take the time to say, I'm going to have that bold, I'm going to have that a bit bigger, or I'm going to have underline. And they use all of these, what I call manual effects within this uh, font area uh, to embolden or make this stand out. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it would be a lot simpler if people used these styles, which are over here. Under the styles box, if I click on styles, it applies a regular um, font that we have. So here I have using heading one. Here I have heading two. And if you look further down, I have some heading threes. Now, if I zoom out again, um, you'll notice that there is, in fact, um, a quite a few of these heading threes. And if I had done these all manually, and I then wanted to change them to red or in the middle, um, you would all be going through here manually doing this yet again. But you see, if you don't and you use or begin to use styles, what you'll find is that you can very easily go here to the styles um, items, choose modify, and on this box, you can then set what it is you want to be um, and where it wants to go um, and lots of more there is plenty of items that you can adjust to that style uh, which can be gr quite greatly into great depth and here if i click automatically update and say okay you now find that all of those heading three styles have actually been changed in very quick time, saving you time, moments and everything else. 
plus the fact it is consistent throughout the document um, uh, ongoingly and you're not jumping back here to find out what size you did, whether you had it underlined, bold, etc. Adding the style or modifying the style is so, so much easier um, from that point of view. OK, I'm just going to also open um, a file here now um, and I'm going to open this Office app, Apple Applications 2, which is or could be a second document. Now here you can see that my level three um, elements that we have actually hang on. Let me just check that. Yeah, sorry, seems to have gone to, to the other one. Let me go to the end and come up. It seems to have got more than the Office app. Office applicants control home delete. There we go. Uh, we've now got just the Apple applications on this um, and I'm just going to click the save button for that. So here you can see that my level three headings are actually of a different style. So I'm going to close this one. And here what we've got is our styles. So the other document may have been prepared using different styles. But the fact is, as long as styles has been applied, I can go to the uh, next page here and I can go insert. Text from file and I can go and find that document um, from the list which is in desktop and the webinar. So here is my other document that bearing in mind has got different styles for heading three um, and that may have been done by a co-worker or somebody else. And here, if I insert those Apple applications document, what you'll actually find is that when you actually go through that, it has actually added all these other um, ones in uh, as a level three element. OK, so it's easy to bring those um, through and in. OK, right, going to the top. Zoom in again. So here we have um, elements for uh, Word, um, elements of shortcuts. Lots of people don't use a lot of the shortcuts. So here we've got a paragraph. And I'm going to move this paragraph above the one at the top. And most of you would probably do it by cut, copy, paste, etc. But what you can do is if you're in the paragraph, you can simply do Alt Shift up arrow. And there I have just altered and swapped those over. If I want to move that paragraph down through the paragraphs, I can do Alt Shift down, 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 down and there just move it into place. Now for that paragraph, I just simply place the cursor inside um, and that assumes and will find a paragraph. But if I wanted to move two paragraphs, then I do have to highlight uh, both paragraphs before using the feature to do Alt Shift up and down uh, to move those through. The only thing that that will not go through is a um, table. So if you need to go above or below a table, uh, then you would need to cut, copy, paste uh, on that process. One of the other things is to select a sentence um, in a paragraph. And again, most people will use the mouse and click and then they'd travel along uh, until they found um, the end of the sentence. Now, if I zoom in there, you might actually see that in fact, I might have got the sentence, but I didn't. In fact, the full stop afterwards is, is not included, etc. The spaces are not included, which is important when you want to move a sentence. So what you'd end up doing is cutting and pasting or dragging, and you'd be left with two full stops and the extra gaps and, and things like that. So the easiest way to actually collect a sentence is actually to hold the control key and then simply click 
into anywhere in the sentence and that will help you select the entire sentence the full stop and the spaces afterwards and this is because if i now want to move that i can click and drag and place it at the beginning of this paragraph and when i've moved it all of the spacing where it's been removed from is correct and not only that because the full stop and the space afterwards have been selected we've got the correct formatting um, here at the end as well. So again, picking uh, the control key, clicking in a sentence, and then we can actually move that um, sentence quite easily across. Nothing stopping you using cut and paste um, in that process, but selecting is quite a valuable tool for that. Another element of selection is that when you want to select something, um, your screen disappears uh, high, very quickly up or down, and this happens in Excel as well. Um, one of the easiest ways of solving this problem is uh, to place your cursor at the beginning where you want to start your selection and then simply scroll through your document until you find where you want to finish and holding the shift key and clicking at the end, um, that has now selected from the point where you started, uh, place by place in your cursor, all the way through to the second click um, while holding the shift key. Now you can again cut, copy, paste, or move that uh, in the normal way that you would do uh, to get it right, but you're not chasing the screen trying to find or line up uh, with the elements. OK. Right, so I'm going to save this document um, just by clicking here and call it demo one. I'm just going to save that into documents. Now, when you're saving documents here, um, you put them obviously somewhere safe, etc. But sometimes there are lots of people who are actually saving documents and they're saving them and calling them templates. Unfortunately, what you'll find is that a document saved with the extension of DOCX um, is not a template. It's actually just a document. So if I made any changes to this and saved it, I would overwrite that document and therefore it wouldn't be a perfect template because in a template form, you can't overwrite it. However, if I want to make a copy of this document, again, lots of people would go file, save as, go to find the location where they want to save it and then click the save button. But one of the buttons that I put on at the beginning on the shortcut key was in fact this um, save as element and the kicker arrow up here. So if I want to update the document, I can click the normal save button. But if I want to make a copy and rename it or do something else with it, then here, if I click on this button, it will immediately present me with um, the save as dialog box um, from there. So here I can go to desktop, go into the webinar, and here I can call this demo 1A and save this straight away from there. So that again is an easy way to create a copy um, of that particular document. Not only that, when you do save it as, um, it will automatically redirect you to the same location as the original document. Uh, so you haven't got to dig down through all those folders um, if you want anything uh, done from there. So to make another copy, I would click this and it will take me straight away back into here and I could make a demo 01B. Uh, I'm not going to here um, because that's just showing you that that works. How many people require a PDF? Again, most people go file, PDF, blah, 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 blah. Um, but now you can go up to this quick access toolbar, down to PDF, click on PDF. It directs you straight away to uh, the 
uh, a regional address of the document, which is the webinar session. And if I now publish this, um, it's as simply as two clicks um, to actually create uh, a PDF document rather than going around the houses through the file menu uh, from there. And hopefully very soon we'll get the web browser up with uh, the PDF document um, that's been produced. We'll bear with that a couple of seconds. Voila. And there we have a PDF document. I'm going to close that one. And there we go for those. Um, lots of things around uh, here. Uh, notice that we're approaching quarter two, so I'm going to just do one more. Um, here we, I'm going to insert a table. Um, now when you're inserting a table, um, please don't insert more than three or four rows when you insert a table. I know you might want more rows, um, but please don't. Um, and the reason for this is that we should run through what I call the basics of tables. Here I have a table, it's four columns, three rows wide. And the first thing that I tend to do is there's three little rules that I add to my tables and get people to remember. And that is to take the first row, so highlight the first row, and under the table design element, uh, come across and choose layout. And when we get there onto the layout ribbon, you have properties over on the left, uh, which you can go into, or you can go up here, which is where it says repeat as a header row. So if I click on repeat as a header row, it means that if this table ever gets to the bottom of the page, then that as a heading, um, Headings will actually be reproduced at the top of any data that falls underneath. Now, secondly, here we have the second and third rows. And what I would normally do with those is I would actually tell those how to be positioned on the left. Do we want them on the left hand side, in the middle, etc., on the baseline or at the top? Now here I'm going to put this in the middle um, and a lot of people might want to um, add things. So here I might want to put address. And the biggest thing is that when people create these for other people to fill in, they normally press the return key to make each of these um, taller uh, to give them room to actually put in uh, details of the address. If I come back to the home ribbon and turn on the show hide button, you'll see all of these returns in, which means that when people do actually add the address, all it actually does is make it bigger. So please, please don't um, add any returns to do that. What we should do is we should actually set this to be the height of that element that we feel is appropriate to accommodate for the address. So here now, what will happen is I can type the address in and the box won't get any bigger unless it actually needs to, but you won't be deleting all those returns you put in at the beginning of the element uh, going through. Now, one of the things that does happen with these is that when you type in an address, When you get to the bottom and you end up putting in the postcode, sorry, like here, um, the other bits to add is what do you want or how do you want these rows to behave? Because currently and by default, if that postcode at the bottom of that address turns up at the bottom of a page, it will actually split and it will leave the main address in one row on page one and ME71QZ would go in another cell on page two. So here is one of the elements whereby highlighting both of these rows, we can go to properties and here is where it actually deals with the rows. And as you can see here, there is an option to say allow row to break across the pages. 
And as that is ticked, that will cause that postcode to go on a separate line on the next page. And what I'm going to do is, because I want addresses to all remain together, I'm going to remove that which then tells this that if the ME71QZ was to be required to go on the second page, it will actually take the entire row down complete with all the beginning of the address as well. So this is now set up so that what you've actually got is just by dealing with those three rows. Oh, sorry, wrong one. You can now use that and if you get to the end of the uh, table, you can simply press the tab key and it will constantly add um, another row. But the good thing is all the additional rows that you add in have all been set for their non-breaking and their height, etc, etc. So that's one good tip for uh, tables and things like that. So I hope that's um, of value to you. OK, it's uh, fast becoming uh, e nearly uh, 11 o'clock, so I'm going to pause there for a moment. Um, if I now save this um, as we go, um, what we've actually got is um, I said to you about two icons on the quick access toolbar, one of which was the save as, which give us another copy straight away rather than going through all the menus. And one of the things that lots of people do is they hit the cross in the top right hand corner to close a document. And when you do that, what it actually does is not only close the document, but often closes the application as well. And that is why I added this other button, which is now just says close. And I can comfortably close that. It will close the Word document, but leave Word open for me to use for another document or open another document from there. So I'm not having to reopen the Word application. OK, so that's where we are at the moment. Now we're going to just uh, take a few questions there if there's any uh, in the chat window. Um, I'm going to open up um, my Teams again. And um, Christian, is there any questions in there at all in the chat window? Yep, yeah, yeah, we do yeah, have, we a, few do have a few questions. Okay. Uh, if I start uh, with Pauline's question, Pauline question, question, which is, is uh, where can uh, I find the thesaurus? In thesaurus, okay. Uh, I'm going to have to minimise that again. <laughs> thesaurus, um, Word, uh, Control N, New, etc., etc. Um, equals and add another one in for there. Um, Thesaurus is under review. Um, so here on the element that's actually got, and here it is um, here on the left hand side. OK, so that's in review over on the left hand side. Is that OK? Any more? Uh, perfect. Yep, we have yep. a question from Yolanda um, who couldn't find the sort section in Word. Couldn't find the? The sort section. Sorry, I still didn't get that, Christian. Uh, sorry, is that better? Sort? Yes, that's right, the sort section. Oh, right, sort. OK, so here, uh, if we've got um, sections perhaps with um, home and perhaps bullets and numbering um, as such from there or etc. No, maybe those. Um, if you actually go here, this is the sort section. Um, it's just the A to Z. So it will look at the V for video and the C for click and it will then sort those um, paragraph by paragraph or by whatever you have in there, either ascending or descending. So if I click that now, what it will do is, as you can see, it swapped it over from C to V uh, and alphabetical from there. OK. Perfect. Thank you, Alex. And there's one more from an anonymous user asking, are all the commands that you've shown on Word uh, compatible on a Mac? 
Um, but the element that I used, um, I'm not a Mac user um, as such, but I understand that my control key is your command key, and nine times out of ten that would actually um, do the thing. So command and uh, alt and shift or whatever, yes, I believe so. If you want to, it's easy to um, just simply go to um, uh, online and type in shortcut keys Mac um, Word or, or something in those sort of format and they are all available. The Microsoft Word shortcut keys come in 24 or 29 A4 pages. So there's plenty of shortcuts. My initial um, instruction when I do training is that if you want to learn some shortcuts, get a very small post-it note and write three shortcuts that you find of value on a post-it note. Place this on your desktop or on the screen somewhere, not in the middle, um, but place that somewhere and look and learn three shortcuts. In a number of weeks or a couple of weeks, you'll find that you've already learned those three and that's the time to pull that one, that piece of, um, uh, what did I say, post-it note off, write three more on, and then learn those. If you do try and learn them from a page, A4 page of shortcut keys, you'll never master them. So always just do a little post-it note with three on, stick them on there until you're not looking at it anymore, then put three new ones up there to, to learn shortcuts. The other way of seeing is that if you've got it, it's probably it might be the same in Mac, I'm not sure, um, but if you do go to anything, um, then you hover, you will in fact see that the shortcut keys get displayed um, when you're actually on a command, etc. Um, from there. Yeah, so here that one hasn't got any, um, but there you go. Yeah, some of those that you have, control V, um, etc. Yeah, so look for your mouse wherever that's hovering uh, to also get some shortcut keys. Any more? Perfect. Uh, we've had a response from Yolanda. Uh, thank you, Yolanda, saying there is no A to Z uh, section anywhere on the toolbar, on Yolanda's toolbar. There is no? Uh, A to Z. A to Z on the yeah. uh, toolbar. Yeah. Um, so that's on the home ribbon. Yeah. So um, Drop me an email, uh, Alanda, um, and you might need to check what version of Office you're actually using. Are you using the online version as opposed to the desktop version? That might be a reason for that um, if you're using the Office 365 online version, uh, which is one alternative. I'd have to check that one, of course, um, but principally um, it's, it's generally here. It shouldn't remove it. Um, unless somebody's actually removed it manually, which I doubt, uh, but we can have a look. Uh, quite happy to talk after the seminar, one-to-one um, -one, uh, with that. Okay. Perfect, thank you, Alex. And we've had a question coming from Gordon. Thank you, Gordon, saying, is there a button uh, in Word that you can click on to upload a document directly into OneNote? into OneNote. Um, yeah. What we have down on OneNote, um, there is a button that you can place on your um, taskbar which says send to OneNote. Um, let me see if it's here. I haven't used this for ages. Um, Microsoft Office Tools. No, I can't find it at the moment, but there is a shortcut key um, that's there. It might actually be in the element of your, sorry, we'll get it right. All commands, S, and then I would look for send, N. So it doesn't look like there's one um, in this particular bit, um, but I'm pretty sure there is 
a, a button that can actually go down here, which you can switch on somewhere in OneNote um, for that, I think. I'd have to look deeper for that. Any more? Yep, uh, we have another question coming from Pauline. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, asking if you work on the desktop version, does it automatically sync with the online version? It depends on where you're parking it, because if you have um, parked it on your OneDrive or your SharePoint, then it will all automatically sync up from, from those. Um, unfortunately, the various places that people store items, etc., everything revolves around obviously an internet connection. Um, but if you've actually set it up, uh, and this might be a techie question more than my question, um, but yeah, it, nine times out of ten, if you're syncing your My Documents to your OneDrive, then they'll automatically sync. Um, but I do know that, i.e., things like desktop, etc., no, will be the answer because normally within a, a, an organisation, uh, they have the techie guys, such as IDM guys, uh, to set that up so that it syncs directly from there my documents, which ends up being uh, their OneDrive or their SharePoint uh, depository. Perfect, thank you, Alex. And a question from Joanna asking, what's the best way to get a video into OneNote? A video into OneNote? Um, can we cover the OneNote at the end? Um, because obviously I don't want to go in and out of those. I am going to OneNote. Uh, maybe Christian, if you can give me uh, a shout at that when I open OneNote. Sure. Thank you. I'll put no worries. And we've had confirmation from Yolanda to say um, that yes, it works in the online version. Right, that'll be the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? No, I think Wonderful. we've caught Wonderful. them all. But yeah, thank you for your questions, guys. Keep them rolling in and okay. I'll get them over to Alex to get you the best answer. OK, right, guys, um, I'm going to minimise this word um, uh, down and we're going to move on to Excel now, which is generally our most popular um, application uh, in use. Um, from the point of view, this is normally around 80 to 90 percent of our training requirements is normally around the Excel um, area arena. Um, however, with our current situation, uh, Teams has obviously come uh, a leaping over the top of that right at the moment due to precedence. But it is one of those things that we don't know how we use them. We just use them the same as we always do. So here you can see all my pinned elements, etc. Uh, same as it was with um, Word. So I'm just going to go straight into a blank document here. Now, Excel is um, a very, very powerful tool um, and it is very easy to do. Again, I would highly recommend go to customize more commands add the two commands that I've said. Here they are up here. Save a copy and obviously close, etc. There are a few more that I find very useful in Excel uh, to go through. But what I'm actually going to do here, first of all, is um, because of a trainer, some of the things that we have to do is we have to create spreadsheets quite quickly. Um, uh, from here, so one of the things that happens is if I type Actually, you go across here, January. I'm sure most people will know that if you click into January and grab the bottom right hand corner with the left mouse button, you can quite easily drag across and it will do months. If I come to the bottom, we do Mon for Monday, Monday, Jan, January today or date. Any one of these, if we grab them, will actually automatically um, fill what's called series that's actually going through. So if you go down or to the right, they will both work. The other thing to think about is that if we put January and then put April, um, when we highlight both of those and drag down, they will actually go quarterly. Um, if you put a date in, um, first of the first, 
20 and then you put in the 8th of the first 20 which is a week apart again now you've got a situation where it will look at the series and we'll put in uh, each week um, commencing going through that there is also elements where we can type a code in the format of this something like the company ADM 001 and those will also automatically series the numbers now this is very useful lots of people find it um, but one of the things that people don't realize is that this is a valuable tool on its own and it's not restricted by all of these which are the default fill series labels so if I come back to uh, sheet one I can now go across here and I might put staff name uh, in here and with this I can actually now fill that down and as you can see I can get a, a load of people's staff names to auto fill I might actually put charities and again, what I can actually do is create charities. And here I can do town. And these are just examples of how you can actually use the field series to actually create um, or help you uh, work. What you have to do is principally highlight or type in your original list. So once you have your original list in your spreadsheet you can highlight it and then go file options advanced and if you get the scroll bar and drag all the way to the bottom there is an element that says edit custom lists and if i click on this what it will do is it will actually have these cell references here which is in fact this range of data and if you then choose import it will put that list of data in here for you and that will then be available on your machine um, within that spreadsheet to run uh, from there. Now, obviously, I've already done those. I've got a load of uh, elements that I use already, so I'm not going to import this again uh, because my list is longer than this. What I will give you the heads up for is that it's not inexhaustible, so you will actually run out um, is there. I think my staff names go down um, quite a long way. I think they're about 25 or something um, staff names yeah still going down what will happen is it will just keep going down until it comes to there we go it started repeating there um, from that list so here i've got 59 um, elements down i think just check thought I only did 25 but I must have been got carried away um, so here yeah what we've got now please bear in mind this is not actually cell relevant but actually character referenced so if you've got big long names like this you will in fact reduce the number of cells because it's limited by characters not actually cells or, or words so be aware of that okay so that's um, custom lists um, elements to which you can actually add in. So here I'm just going to put in some uh, details. Um, so here I put in some numbers. Fairly easy to do. I'm going to highlight um, these figures and change them so that they're all two decimal places. Now, when we look at a spreadsheet, lots of people again are using these. And one of the things that we did in Word was the fact that when we did Word um, and we creating spreadsheets, um, lots of people were using these manual tools to be bold, italic, underline, font size, etc. If you're going to go down that route, you're doing the same thing as you did in Word. So my advice is obviously go here 
choose your headings and over on the right here we have cell styles uh, which means that we can actually go through and say oh okay i'm going to use um, this one here 20 percent um, as a headings and if i created another sheet of that with those what now happens is i've got two sheets with the headings on but if i then change that style right mouse click and modify if we had those throughout the rest of the uh, sheets maybe in our book um, then uh, we can change them so the font is actually red and bold etc um, and now we've actually done that and it would apply that across all the sheets uh, that you do rather than doing them manually and then trying to copy the format in across so again think about using styles um, when you actually do that if you're creating a sheet i'm going to use Control z and undo those at the moment because uh, there's another element to this um, one of the things i always tell people to be very wary of is that when people do the auto sum at the top if I go across here and say auto sum and click that, it highlights the range it thinks um, is suitable for adding up. Can I please highlight to everybody, please, 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 please check your formulas that they are in fact doing the correct range because autocorrect is one of the biggest problems that causes errors within spreadsheets and the reason for that being is that if there is an empty gap and you've got a very tall uh, range to add up if the other element is out of sight and you quickly think oh yeah auto sum done um, what you've actually found is that it's actually stopped short and therefore you've now got an error and if you dragged that across you'd only end up adding these up and not including the top. So when you do do auto sum, please use auto sum, check the formula that's actually been applied so that you can actually reassess it and correct it if necessary um, and make sure that your figures are correct. A very true fact is another element is that when we do something like this, we might have something like a column for reference and in that reference there might actually be a number for somebody but you see if I go over here and this is totals again clicking the auto sum would in fact see the reference number and therefore include it and now this is a scenario where we don't want that because it's a reference number for the person or the individual or the company and it really should only be adding up those figures as opposed to uh, the references as well uh, so be very cautious of the auto sum uh, just make sure you check it um, because you can let errors slip in very easily i'm going to delete this one that's actually here and we've got totals i'm going to delete the one down the bottom um office 2013 came in with some added features um lots of people still use the auto sum um and i'll, I'll have a guess that probably 90 percent of uh, attendees today are using the auto sum but you see there are elements here whereby if i highlight the range of numbers i now have this little kicker of uh, corner at the bottom here and if i click on that this is the quick analysis tool and if i go to totals i can very easily now add the sum row the average row the count row a percentage or even a running total uh, along the bottom so here i'm going to do um, sum a lot actually i'll do average along the bottom here and if i come to this one and go totals again over here we only see the sum but if we click the arrow to the right it extends to do all the verticals and now you can see that i can actually run the same 
uh, formats across there and easily do the sum total uh, for those. So very easy to do now um, and making the auto sum a little bit redundant uh, from there. And it also solves some of these um, elements um, in here that uh, we would have had uh, issues with uh, from that. So please um, feel free uh, to look out for this quick app quick analysis tool um, to do some of your figures and everything else. There are, of course, other things that it um, <clears throat> can actually do. Um, so here um, with highlighting various ones of that, uh, we can actually get it to do, um, where's it gone? Uh, data bars, uh, etc. cetera. Um, spark lines for the end. Um, it's on in the total ones, but they can actually do that if it was uh, there. If I do that and then delete the numbers. So this is the range for that. If I clear the formatting for those. Formatting data bars. Uh, clear format. So here we've got a trend line or um, spark lines as they're commonly known for the datas that are actually there. So what we got the biggest ones, if I do 4,000, you'll actually see that the range or the charts on the right hand side will modify accordingly. OK, right. Um, so uh, lots of areas uh, along those uh, types of things. Um, I'm going to get rid of this one on the right now. And I'm going to get rid of the one down the bottom. Um, one of these things that have come out, which a lot of people haven't used, and this one really amazes me. Um, and what I'd like to see is, um, if you know about this, can you please write in the text, yes, I knew. And if you didn't know about this, can you write, no, I didn't know, um, just out of curiosity so that we can see um, how many people do did or didn't know this. And then I'll tell you when it all started. So what we've actually got here is um, a range. And if I go to the home menu and I format this table uh, as a table um, here, I can actually create this as a table. And this is the range that we've got selected. This is saying that my table has headers. And if I say OK, it's now formatted that as a table. Now we've now got contextual ribbons up here for table design. And I'm going to go across here and put sales 2020 press return to name the table. Now this feature has been in here a little while and what it means is that this is now a formatted table and if I type total on the end, what automatically happens is it get, adds in that column that we add. Now normally when you do a auto sum, something like this, um, what it would do is you check the auto sum and when it's OK, you would get the result and then have to grab the bottom right hand corner to fill that series down or the formula down. But when it's in a format as table option, watch what happens when I press return, enter. And as you can see, it's automatically um, populated all of the totals down. Now, the other thing is that when you're in a table and you've got all these table tools, which are now on the contextual ribbon, we can also come across here and say, OK, we can highlight the first column and it turns it bold. We can highlight the last column because they're the totals. Uh, currently, we have banded rows in, but we can turn the banded rows off and put banded columns in so that it looks differently and their focus is vertical as opposed to horizontal. And the last one here is um, the total row. We can add the total row at the bottom. And as you can see, it's already added up the grand total. Um, now, one other thing that happens when you have a range set as format as table is that when you want to do something like go here and in the total row, you can now click the down arrow 
and say, actually, count how many charities we have. We can go here and we can click the down arrow and say, what is the average for January? What is the sum uh, of February? What is the count or the uh, maximum or the minimum from there? But all of these are now options to us to actually just click and change. If we do find one that we actually want, so here I'm going to do the sum, I can still grab the corner and drag it all the way across and get my figures. So as you can see, formatting as a table is quite good. Now, a good thing about table uh, formatting as a table is that if you really knew how to do bullets and numbering, you'd know that tab, 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 tab moves a range. So if I go down the bottom, if this was a normal data range, when you press tab, what happens when you get to the end is it just keeps going. However, when you're in a table, it doesn't. It actually gets to the end and then goes down to the next row. And the good thing about that is that you can use the tab key consistently. You can also use shift tab to go backwards as opposed to forwards. But the most important one is that if I wanted to add another one to the bottom of this row and I was data entry in, <coughs> excuse me, I could actually type tab, type tab, type tab, 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 tab. When I get to the formula, I simply click tab, tab. And what it does is automatically insert a row after my data entry and expand the total row down. But not only that, any formulas that are in these rows would also be carried down. Um, and now I can actually put Alex Mead, um, ISPCA dot third, and then I can put some figures in there. Tab, tab and carry on as normal, just using that as data entry. Obviously, if you want to remove them, you do need to use the right mouse click and delete. And if you want to insert them in the middle, then you do use your right mouse click and insert from there. But the good thing is, as I said, all your formulas are automatically being carried down and you don't have to remember to fill those down as en route. So format as table, a very useful tool um, and um, very easy. The other good thing about that is that you can be anywhere on your spreadsheet and because and as providing you've named it and they're not all called table one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you do want to go to a table, you can simply go to the left here, click on the named range, which in this case is the table, and it will take you immediately back to that. So it can be used as a navigational element as well, um, if you so wish uh, from from that going forward. OK, so that's uh, one of Excel. Uh, so here I'm going to put um, table, name it. Uh, I'm going to move on to sheet two. We've already got some of those. Now, one of the things that happens is um, lots of people uh, have formulas and they have very long formulas that actually come up. And in the workplace, it's normally somebody, just one person or a couple of people who are writing these very complex formulas. Um, and one of the quick tips I have for this is if you are one of those people, um, when you start typing, um, so if I type false, uh, sorry, equals index, um, we start getting, put it right, match. Yeah, open bracket. Uh, you start seeing all these elements here, which are the functions and features that actually follow through. And sometimes they're not very helpful for people um, to follow because they still don't know what the lookup value is, lookup array, etc. So one of my tips is um, when you've actually typed the formula in, um, what you can do is actually create it so that here, if I do equal uh, full stop, Might be index. There we go. Uh, what I've actually done is I created an autocorrect here 
Um, let me um, move it over here so that it's easier to see. Um, and in fact, what I've done is I've redone it so that it puts equals index uh, and then um, looks at the um, part of the formula and I've written in the areas there. So index is the step three, the results column. So here I'm going to put in this one. And then I'm going to go match, uh, which is step one, the lookup cell. So I'm going to put that in there. And then step two is the lookup column. And I'm going to look up those. And here, by typing in a little different wording as such, I can actually put that in. And if I now come to um, here, control C and paste that in there, now you can see that we've actually got this looking up and the formula that I actually used was an auto correct one again. Uh, and if I go here, full stop index, I've actually put that formula in and it helps people in these elongated formulas um, if you can type something that's meaningful to to actually find them and then they have these uh, to do. So uh, another quick tip there as to typing your formulas in uh, and then creating a, a shortcut um, uh, autocorrect uh, to help people uh, put the formulas in uh, from that. OK. So, uh, yeah, very useful tool uh, to run those through. Okie doke, uh, let me get rid of that one. Oh, sorry, get rid of that one. Now, back to uh, our format as table. The other thing that happens um, just by and by, I've just re recalled, is that if you actually applied the data filtering on here, um, such as here, um, if this was a general data table and not a format as table, if I was to uh, create a filter uh, by selecting just a variety of these, doesn't want me to choose any. When you filter them in place, um, any of the grand totals, which I forgot to tick, Uh, where is it? Uh, oh, I haven't done them. Didn't add the total one in. Sorry. Let's undo that. OK, so if I add the total row back. Uh, I know what's wrong because I'm doing it here. Should be doing it in this one. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, so here, yes, if I uh, got the totals down the bottom, if I click on here and just choose or filter a few, and filter, what will happen is this data has been a subtotal of the filtered list. But if it was this one, uh, which is next door, which is not a format as table, it's just a data set. Um, when I do um, these in here, if I filtered those, um, then what would happen is it would actually just give you um, the grand total still because it will still be looking uh, at those others. Actually, again, forgot to do the total run. Blank. OK, so here this is now adding up uh, all of those, which it isn't. It um, should be two, three, etc. there. So another benefit of using format as table. OK. Okie dokie. Right, um, so here I'm just going to put the data sheet so that I don't get that mixed up again uh, with that. Now, one of the other things that here, this is field series. New sheet. 
And here what we've got is a whole host of uh, sheets running across from left to right. And if we've got these 15 or 20, most people will use um, the arrow keys um, to move from left to right. So here they would use these arrows to move or transfer between one or the other. The actual easiest way of actually doing that is if you take your mouse cursor to the arrows and do right mouse click, you will actually get a list of all of the sheets within your spreadsheet. And now you can just simply double click on it uh, to go straight away to that particular sheet. So double click and it will jump. So when you've got a long list of tabs down the bottom, uh, please don't use these arrows. Uh, you can actually just right mouse click uh, and see all of your sheets all in one line and just double click on them straight forward. OK. How are we doing? Right, we're around to half an hour, so that went very quickly, didn't it? Um, OK, uh, have we got any questions, Christian? Hi, Alex. Hi, uh, yes, uh, we have yes, a few questions. Oh, sorry, sorry for the audio feedback there, guys. Right. Um, um, yeah, there's a bit of audio yeah, feedback on the webinar. Hopefully that resolves itself in a second. Right. Which looks like it has great. So the first question um, with, from Eva asking if you could just explain again how to create the cell um, with the bars based on the numbers in the row. Say that again slowly. Um, if you could explain again the part where you um, create the cell with the bars based on the numbers in the row. Based on the numbers in the row. Data series as in Ah, right, yes, with you. OK, uh, right, so what we have here, if I um, go to this one, what we have is a range of numbers, and this is what's commonly known as a um, insert slicer, um, spark lines. This is here under insert menu. So these are called spark lines. Now, when I highlight the range, spark lines are in fact in this quick access, uh, uh, quick analysis tool. And here I can either have a line or a column running up giving me those data. If I've got win or lose, uh, so negative values, I could have a win or loss element. Um, but once we've actually done that, here is the spark line. So I could in fact do it the other way around. So if I go into this one and then go insert spark lines and I'll do a line there, it will bring up this dialog box. So as I've chosen the cell I want the line to be in, I can now choose this one to choose the range in which I want it to gather. And this is obviously the selected cell that I had. So it's two ways of doing that. Once you've actually done that, you are then able to just fill that down. So there I have two spark lines, one which is the columns, and one which is the lines uh, from there. And then if you look further at the uh, uh, contextual ribbon, there's a whole host of other things that you can add, uh, high point, uh, highlight, etc. cetera. Um, probably if I do that one, high point, you can see that it's highlighting the one. So lots of other bits to add to that. Is that correct for what you wanted? Uh, I hope that answers your question, Eva. And if it doesn't, just let me know. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for that, Alex. Um, we have a question also from Joanna. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Asking if you could just repeat the very first stage where you firstly made it a table. OK, so this one's already done. Uh, so when it's a table, you'll get a table design or a, a contextual ribbon. A contextual ribbon is something or a feature that has got its own ribbon. It's only um, visible when you're in it. So here you can see all the table designs and tools, much like I did with the element. However, if I step outside of the table, you notice that the contextual ribbon goes. So like the lottery, you've got to be in it to win it. 
in contextual ribbons you have to be in the table to see it however let me go back to this data sheet so this is a data sheet and currently is not a format as table so what i did was if you highlight this uh, and then or the data you can then go to the home ribbon and go across here to format as table and then choose your preferred design uh, from there so if i click that that would then turn that in the table and the first thing i would actually do um, would in fact highlight please name your table otherwise you're going to call be called table one two three four five six and you won't know what they're about and when naming a table you can't start with a number and you can't have any spaces so it has to start with a letter um, no spaces etc you can use underscores but i generally tend to avoid underscores because if they're in hyperlinks or formulas they sometimes can be missed um, so one of the things i would do is is name that table uh, correctly and the other thing is it can't be called anything like AD 2020 because there's a column AD and there's a row 2020. So you have to think it can't be anything that could be uh, allocated to something like a cell reference either. OK, uh, so yeah, so that's how that's done. Uh, I'm going to undo that so that I've got one. I hope that's answered that question initially. Yeah, any more? Perfect. Thank you, Alex. That is all I can see for now. But again, equally, guys, thank you uh, for your question, Chris. Uh, still keep handing right. them in and we'll get right. them answered. OK, right. So we've got all not very long. So uh, let me go and do a little bit about um, Outlook. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze in these two. They're not going to be dramatically big or anything else like that, but they will be things for you to take away with you. Um, now, I have Outlook. Um, biggest problem with Outlook, I find, is that people can't manage or don't manage their inbox very well. Um, and what we find is that most inboxes have got hundreds upon hundreds of emails. Um, I have a, a theory in mind which I go with, and that is I work over here with a series of folders which are called action, pending, waiting, training and complete. And what happens is if there is an element that I need, um, I actually click on it, open it up and then I allocate it. So I basically triage my emails uh, whenever I dive into my inbox before I actually start dealing with things. Um, but one thing I'd like to do, first of all, is um, when you get an email from somebody, um, just to tell people, um, we might end up with an email and you may open it and you might be the first time that you get a message. Um, if you are replying to a message, lots of people just simply do this. They hit the reply button, start typing and then press the send button. And for me, that is your biggest mistake uh, in those process because you miss the opportunity of actually creating your own helpful element. So James here has sent me a message, um, etc. And his title has been Camellia Training Catch Up Call. It's not very clear, etc. from there. So what I normally do is when I hit the reply button, the first thing I look at is the subject line. And what I tend to do is I normally do this. And now what I've actually done is um, I've actually replaced the subject matter to initially put uh, the recipient's name. Uh, I've then put a vertical line and my own name and company. And then I've put in brackets what the call or what the email is regarding, because then when you fill in the details and say send, what happens is that heading actually arrives on the recipient's address and immediately without even opening that they get a clear message that it is for them 
it is and they see immediately who it's from myself my company and hopefully when they put those two names together um, whatever you put in the subject matter gives a clear definition just by looking at the subject matter what it's all about now i'm hoping that when i send that back to james he does just hit the reply button because that will then come back to me and again give me still the same information saying yes it's james from adm uh, to me uh, and it's regarding camellia training or whatever from there and that will go back and it will then easier to identify emails just from the subject matter rather than having to open it and dig a deeper into uh, those particular questions. So that's my first tip is always think about modifying uh, the subject matter uh, on when you do hit the reply buttons. And the answer to your question is, does it um, break the conversation? No, if you're doing a reply, as long as you are hitting the reply buttons all the time, it will retain the uh, uh, conversation emails of people going backwards and forwards so uh, that is only broken by someone starting a brand new email okay so over here i've got emails and here if i also said to people um when i want to um triage my emails i basically um, move them to a folder i mark them as unread i categorize them and i put them as a reminder um, if i had to do that for every email i did manually it could well take me a long time but you see i use these as my triage and what i actually do is up here there's what's called the quick access toolbar and through these you can actually see what we're actually doing so here if i click on this email of uh Kalis, it's already complete etc so yeah once that's actually done i can just simply say okay complete and now that has been moved uh, across into uh, this area and it's already done uh, and put in that box so on the emails again uh, workplace if that's an action one uh, click one and it goes across there and as you can see it's marked it as unread uh, and they're in there and it's categorized and flagged for reminders through so all of my inbox I create these various ones uh, to move them uh, into uh, particular elements so what I actually happen is I can focus directly on the action ones that need to be done immediately then go to pending uh, which is the second uh, category to to be looked at and then obviously waiting waiting for somebody else to get back to me uh, anything to do with training go straight into training and complete is the ones that I actually put in complete so that um, later on now lots of people say to me well why don't you just file them in your um, folders well I triage my emails at the beginning of the day and put them in this list but what happens with all these during the day is they get moved to the completed folder and then when they're in the completed folder uh, when it's nearly time to go home or I'm coming to the end of the day that's when I take five minutes to move everything from the completed folder into their respected folders to live permanently and what that allows me to do is also just give me a refresher at the end of the day of all the work that I've actually done in case I've missed something like oh I was going to send James that um, course outline or something like that that you, you may have mentioned and thought about. But it also helps you focus on moving those emails uh, directly to um, those particular files and folders. OK, so how do we create those quick steps? Um, well, principally what we have here is up at the top we have quick steps. And if I go down to uh, a new quick step and I always go for custom, and this, um, please explore quick steps, not for my triage or for anything, but just for the purpose of using a quick step for whatever you can think it will work for you in your working day. So here I'm going to call it training demo. 
Um, and the reason I put a number by it, I'm going to put number eight, I think, um, here, um, is that once you've actually named it, you can tell it to, i.e. move to a folder, move to training, add an action, choose an action, mark it as unread, add an action, categorize the message. And if you've got the categories, you can null it. So I'm going to call this one uh, action, add an action, flag the message for a reminder for next week. And you can carry on doing all these. Now, if I just add an action and call this up here, you can see all the various things that you can allocate to this one click. So you can reply to a meeting, respond with a new message, forward it, reply to, reply to all, create a meeting, et cetera, et cetera. You can add three or four or, or however many you want to this one click um, to create. Uh, I'm going to bin that one because I've done everything that I want to. Now, I normally keep the quick steps down to nine. And the reason being is that at the bottom here, we have a shortcut which means that if I want to apply those particular um, quick steps to emails, I can actually use the shortcut keys. So if it's going to go in action, I will do control shift one. If I'm going to put this in training, it's going to be control shift eight. So I'm going to allocate control shift eight to that. I can put in here demo training. And anything that you type in this tooltip box, it will give that when you hover on the respective number or quick tip, uh, quick step in that list. So if I now do finish, uh, you'll see them here. And at the top, you can see demo and there you can see uh, demo training underneath. But it's also telling me that control shift eight will activate any emails. So if I now go to here, um, and go to the inbox. Uh, this one, I can do control shift eight and that's now been moved into the training. And as you can see, um, it's been categorized, flagged and everything else uh, from there. So you could literally go through this list doing control shift one, two, three, four, etc. cetera, um, straight away uh, to actually deal that. Okay, so, um, some quick tips here. The other one is um, one of the ones that I like is if you want to actually add a contact to your contacts list, uh, lots of people will open the email and sorry, close that one. See if this one's got one. There we go. So this is an email and you might have a list of contacts at the bottom. Um, and one of the things that lots of people do is they copy the details off here and add it um, into uh, their contact details over this side. Um, and one of the things that I like about this is, oh, sorry, I closed it. Sorry, folks. The easiest way to actually add um, something that you have um, for a contact is to grab the email with the left mouse button and drag and drop it onto the contacts list. When you do that, what happens is it opens a contact window, but it puts the email into the note section. And with that, what you can then do is you can highlight various bits of the uh, notes and you can drag and populate um, any of those other uh, details into filling up uh, the elements that goes through. When you're done, you can literally do control A, which is the command for select all, delete that. But what you've actually done is manage to populate your contacts uh, easier and simpler um, going through. And once you've saved it, it puts all those details in. So drag and drop onto your contacts uh, to add more contacts. And can I say that it is very 
um, important that you populate your contacts list um, because a lot of the applications um, in Teams and Skype and all those uh, actually refer to your Outlook contacts list uh, for people's names, addresses, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So the more you populate your contacts, the benefit, more benefit you'll get uh, from the applications uh, across all of the applications. OK. OK, any questions on Outlook? Because we're 10 to already. Chris, Hi, Alex. Question? Hi, yes, sorry. Um, um, we have a question from Mark asking if it's possible to delay the delivery of emails sent from Outlook online. Not online, I don't believe. I might be wrong in that because that's a question I've not been asked before. Um, that's not to say you can't or you can. Uh, I've not come across it or need been asked for it recently. Uh, we can check that. It would be in your options. Um, obviously, you have the delay option um, here where you can delay it to go first. Please bear in mind, though, that um, if you, depending on your setup, um, if you do use delay and you're using your own Outlook at home, your uh, Outlook has to be open for that to send it. Um, I know people who do the delay send um, and they've working from home and they've turned their computer off and it hasn't gone. Um, so it has to be on an exchange or a server base uh, that in order to make it uh, delay. Uh, for that reason, I think it should be in the online one, but don't quote me at this time. Perfect. Thank you, Alex. And for Outlook, that seems to be it with the questions currently. Is it? Cool. OK, um, right. I'm aware of the time, folks, um, so I'm going to avoid um, PowerPoint if I if you will excuse me um, because there's a couple of other things that I'd like to say based on um, Isaac's which he had in the morning done this morning um, and that is a one for one note which is there uh, this is a very un, um, unused tool that is very 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 valuable um, and I think what was the question for this one note one was video going in wasn't it at the beginning, yes, right. how do um, we embed yeah. videos into one? Um, so here um, it depends on where the video is coming from, uh, from from that line. So here you can put an online video, which you then get from YouTube or having another link, etc. My own personal point with video, the same as when it goes into PowerPoint, is that a lot of people link to the video and put it into OneNote and um, PowerPoint. And then what they do is they get somewhere or other people try to view it. And because of the internet connections and the variables of it, it sometimes doesn't work that well. So for me, I would generally insert the video completely um, by physically putting that in um, as an item. So if it was on YouTube, I would find a third party tool to download it and place it somewhere where you're guaranteed to have, if it's internal, somewhere on your server so it's easy and running smoothly. If it's um, on your own, you can put it into Stream or you can put it into Sway um, and areas like that. But everything runs around. I think with video and audio, um, you have to be a little bit careful putting them in. But principally um, here, if it's into that section, um, make a page, add a new page, call it videos. And then you can uh, insert video so online video and then type in the link for youtube or whatever uh, that you get from it or if it's on your file uh, then you would insert it as an object element from that so record uh, etc so you can get a link to it uh, from there so here pick a link you can go and actually find um, the video on your server etc etc get the link from that that's the best way to put them in it really depends on the purpose and who's viewing 
as to how they're going to go in uh, with that. I think it's a big question. If you've got any queries, um, I suggest dropping me a line and, and we can have a telephone conversation uh, to go into it into more details, I think, for that one. Um, but uh, just going back to um, these. Um, so here, these are all my books, uh, workbooks that we have. And a workbook is exceptionally good to add to Teams. Um, whereby you can actually share that work with everybody and everybody can have their own section or group and pages along here. And certainly for meetings and things like that, a workbook assigned to a team uh, works a treat. Um, you don't have to keep uh, adding lots of um, bits and pieces or connectors through the chat or the team or the channels. Uh, you can centralise it here and then place that list in. Uh, so it's very, very good um, to do. And if you've got things for people to do, uh, it's quite easy to add in um, their tasks and everybody will then be able to see um, where people are. So you could have literally um, uh, sections for each individual person or pages for individual people, etc. You just need to actually think about OneNote a little bit more on that process. If I just minimise that and open up um, this one here and go across to my teams, uh, which I have. Um, so here I've got my office um, Teams element and down the bottom here we've got notes um, and this is open to all the team members. Um, but if anybody wants to collaborate things, as you see here, I've just put a link in there um, and it's up here, uh, training notebook. Uh, so I've tagged it up at the top. So regardless of where they go in the conversation, they can get at um, that element uh, straight away, even on here, and it brings in those client notes um, to edit and etc. from there. So clear to edit the notebook and that would then um, open up and things. So certainly uh, worthwhile going through uh, OneNote for those uh, and bits and pieces. Um, so yeah, uh, valuable tool now, Teams, and uh, as uh, Isaac said at the beginning, um, ADM are quite happy and eager to help you with your admin side of um, uh, that where certain security and controls are taking place. But if you want any um, user end training uh, to organisations, then feel, feel free to uh, come back to me on that. Is there any more questions there, um, Christian, because we're coming up to 12 o'clock? Yep, there's no current questions in the chat at the moment. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so I'll just pop back to um, PowerPoint here um, and pull up this um, one slide um, which we got. Um, this is how to um, contact us um, from uh, after the event. Uh, my name's Alex Walterston. I am Microsoft Certified Trainer and my company is F Keys. Um, you can contact me Alex at f-keys.co.uk. I have a Twitter handle of Alex Walterston if you care to follow that. Um, some of our courses are on Eventbrite um, at AWMCT. Um, however, I'm also on LinkedIn. And what I would say to you, if you are a corporate organisation, uh, pop along to uh, the event bright, but there is a form to fill in uh, for corporate companies because we'd rather talk to you uh, personally because we'd like to make our training more relevant to you and your team rather than just uh, allow you to just join um, collaborative courses. We prefer to focus on people for larger organisations, but if anybody wants another course or an avenue for that, then they're online. And of course, if you've got any questions or queries, feel free to contact Isaac um, uh, for IT support, teams, admin, security, etc. And anything techie, 
um, on 01227 473501 um, and his email is just isaac at adm-computing.uk um, and that is really I think the end of today's seminar. I hope you've uh, all enjoyed it um, and this has been uh, ADM uh, doing their presentation. I think that's it. Any more questions or from here? Hi Alex, no I think we're um, all done. Uh, again thank you so much guys for uh, joining us today for the Teams and Microsoft Office Tips and Tricks. Um, I will put the future ADM events uh, link in the chat along with ADM's LinkedIn. But other than that, if there's anything for more from you Alex? Order. No, uh, thank you for attending. Thank you for all those who stand. Please stay healthy and happy and uh, inside and stay at home. Um, but please feel free to reach out to ADM or myself if we can help you in any way, shape or form. Uh, we ADM have lots of partners um, who can certainly cover most of the ground uh, going forward and um, look forward to hearing from you. Uh, please give your feedback and we'll be much obliged. Thank you.